Greetings, this is Greg. In 1942, Germany introduced the Focke Wolf FW 190A4 variant. This was a variant that's now largely forgotten, but came oh so close to being a game changer. I know most of you are familiar with the FW 190A or Anton series, but let's have a quick refresher. There was the A1 and then the A2. Both of these had reliability problems and were a bit low on power. Along came the A3, which was arguably the first really good FW-190. It featured the BMW 801D2 air-cooled radial engine. This was a reliable engine by German standards of the time, and by taking advantage of Germany's relatively high-octane C3 fuel, it put out 1,700 horsepower. Let's leapfrog over the A4 for a moment and go to the A5. The A5 is a bigger airplane. It has a longer fuselage, but with the same engine. It could carry a greater variety of weapons and had a host of other upgrades, but with the same amount of horsepower in a heavier airplane, bottom line is that the 190A5 was really a step back in terms of the plane's dogfighting capability, but a step forward in all other regards. So you have two airframes within the Anton models. The shorter, lighter original, with few exceptions that was used from for the A1 through the A4s, and then the longer fuselage version used on the A5s and later models. Collectively, say the A3 through the A8, the 190 Anton was one of the greatest fighters of World War II, but not in the conventional sense. By that I mean not in terms of overall performance and not in terms of its ability to dogfight. In fact, as a dogfighter, I wouldn't even put the Anton in the top 10 fighters of World War II. However, if I was attacking a formation of B-17s and wanted to shoot one down and live to tell about it, the Anton would be my first choice among the commonly flown prop-driven fighters of the war. If I had to fly a ground attack mission in a single-engine airplane, the 190 would be near the top of my list as well. And of Axis fighters, it would be at the top of that list. However, if I have to dogfight a P-51 Mustang, I really don't want to be in a 190 Anton. Thus, when considering the three things fighter pilots were likely to do, fly against bombers, against ground targets, or against fighters, the Anton excels at two of them and is mediocre in the third. As they say, two out of three ain't bad, especially when your team has scores of Messerschmitt Bf 109s to tackle the enemy fighters. Thus, the 190A5 and the subsequent Antons were biased a little bit away from anti-fighter and a bit more towards the other roles. None of this should be construed as me saying Antons can't take on enemy fighters. They could, especially the Soviet stuff. It's just not their strong suit. The 190A4, which is what this video is about, is essentially an A3 but with an improved radio and some other upgrades. You can spot an A4 because it uses the shorter nose, like most of the A3s, but with a triangular antenna mount on top of the vertical stabilizer. And the A4 is the only model that combines those two features. The big change for the A4, and the change that didn't really take hold, was the addition of MW50, aka methanol water injection. This took that BMW radial from 1700 to 2100 horsepower in 1942, which gave the short-nosed 190 one of the best power-to-weight ratios of fighter planes of its time. Sadly, I don't have a lot of information on this, so we're going to have to piece this story together as best we can. For example, in this book, there is a statement saying the 190A4 had provisions for water methanol injection. In this book, we have a section that indicates that MW-50 was used on the A-4s in cross-channel bombing runs. I tried to track down the sources used by these authors and hit nothing but dead ends. Still, it makes sense. We know that Focke Wolf wanted to get more power out of the engine. Spraying in water methanol is a great way to do that. We also know that in 1938, Hermann Goering gave an award to Britain's Sir Harry Ricardo for his work on water and water methanol injection. So the Germans certainly knew about this technology and understood it from very early on. The FW-190 certainly wasn't the only fighter to get water methanol injection. The P-47 Thunderbolt went from 2,000 horsepower up to 2,300 with it. Then with more spray from the system, it went up to 2,600 and eventually 2,800, although the 2,800 horsepower variant had a pretty significantly upgraded engine as well. We saw similar power increases using water injection from Corsairs and Hellcats, 109s, 
and the Japanese had it working on the Ki-84. I have an entire video series on the Ki-84. I think it's the most exhaustive look at this airplane on YouTube. Please like and subscribe and check out my other videos. In the case of the FW-190, it appears that water methanol injection was only used on some A4s and possibly in testing on some A5s and then was abandoned. So what went wrong? Why couldn't they use this technology to keep bumping up the power in increments so that the Anton could stay competitive with the power increases seen with the Allied fighters? Why wasn't the Luftwaffe able to fly a 2300 horsepower Anton in 1943? It appears, and keep in mind, I'm kind of shooting in the dark here, but it really does appear that the problem was the sudden drop in temperature during the compression stroke causing cracks in the cylinder heads. I occasionally see references to that, like this one on Wikipedia, but again, when I try to track the sources down, I always hit a dead end. It makes sense, though, and that brings us to something called shock cooling. There is a theory in aviation, and it's a strong theory, that rapid cooling of an aircraft cylinder head can lead to it cracking. Over time, those cracks will spread and eventually cause engine failure. Some people consider shock cooling to be a complete myth, and some of those people are pretty credible, so we need to get into this. Lycoming, a manufacturer of air-cooled aircraft engines, has this to say on the subject. Quote, Sudden cooling is detrimental to the good health of a piston aircraft engine. Lycoming Service Instruction 1094D recommends a maximum temperature change of 50 degrees Fahrenheit per minute to avoid shock cooling the cylinders. Unquote. They go on to list the possible problems from sudden cooling, and you will find the cracked cylinder heads are on that list. This airline, Ameriflight, for decades operated the largest fleet of lycoming engined aircraft in the world, probably the largest fleet of turbocharged piston engine aircraft in the world. Ameriflight absolutely thought that shock cooling was an issue. In fact, their whole pilot training program for these airplanes centered around not shock cooling the engines. Their pilots were instructed to avoid reducing manifold pressure more than two inches every two minutes during descent. And they did get a lot of life out of these turbocharged Lycoming engines powering these Piper Chieftains. So it would seem there is some pretty strong evidence for the existence of shock cooling from both the engine manufacturer and the largest operator of those engines. Yet there are people who say it's a myth. They do make some strong points. Training aircraft spend a lot of time in the traffic pattern with the throttle being suddenly pulled back with the mixture full rich. That should generate the maximum amount of cooling, and yet they don't crack cylinder heads at some rate way above industry averages. It's the same with aerobatic aircraft. They go from full power to idle all the time. The same can be said about planes that carry skydivers or tow gliders. They often go from full power in a climb to idle power and an immediate descent to landing, clearly a shock cooling type situation. Yet they don't constantly crack cylinders. So are Lycoming and Ameriflight dead wrong? No, they are not. Guys, the devil is in the details with this kind of stuff. Let's pull up that Lycoming document again. Notice it recommends a maximum temperature change, maximum, of 50 degrees Fahrenheit per minute. That's a lot. In my experience, it's not realistically possible to get a rate of cooling that high in the traffic pattern with a trainer-type airplane. Their little normally aspirated engines don't get that hot in the first place, plus you're not going fast enough to get a lot of cooling, and you're not up very high in really cold air. Maybe there is some situation in which you could shock cool your Cessna 152 or your Cherokee 140. Perhaps if you took the time to crawl one of these planes up to 10,000 feet, went full rich on the mixture, throttled idle, nosed it down, and dove accelerating to redline? Maybe. But even then, I'm not so sure. But it's another thing entirely when you have a very closely cowled turbocharged or supercharged air-cooled engine running on boost with a lean mixture at altitude. There's a lot of heat happening in those cylinders and under those cowlings, so much so that pilots of Piper Chieftains will tell you they can see their turbos glowing red hot in cruise flight flying at night. The Chieftain and many other turbocharged piston-powered airplanes can climb to 25,000 feet. Normally you wouldn't do that in a Chieftain because it's an unpressurized airplane, but you certainly could. Now, if you're up at 15,000 feet over Montana in January and you go full ridge, pull the power off in this airplane and descend at high speed, it's a pretty fast airplane, 
you certainly can exceed that 50 degrees per minute number. So yes, shock cooling is a thing. It's just not a thing at low altitudes and low speeds in most normally aspirated airplanes. Back to the FW-190. Its radial engine is very closely cowled, and of course, it's supercharged, so it can get pretty hot. Water methanol injection has a very strong cooling effect, and contrary to popular belief, most of that cooling takes place in the cylinder and combustion chamber when the piston is on the compression stroke. Of course, many World War II engines could and did run just fine with water methanol injection, and many of them were air-cooled. However, the German engines, and especially the BMW 801, were plagued by metallurgy problems. Callum Douglas, the author, has a large portion of one of his books dedicated to that issue. I think it's likely metallurgy was a factor here. Do we know with certainty that the cylinders were cracking or that it was caused by MW50? No, but all the evidence seems to point that direction. For example, no operational A5 or later Anton had MW50. It appears they tried and gave up in pretty short order. That would indicate that they ran into a serious problem that could not be easily solved. Heads cracking due to metallurgy problems seems to fit the evidence we do have. Keep in mind, by this point in the war, Germany was having some real difficulty keeping up the supply of various types of metal. Some A5s were fitted with the U-17 strike package. This was for ground attack. It added hard points and armor to the airplane, along with something called C3 injection. You can see a diagram of it here. This is really going to be another video, but for now, think of it as a water injection system that simply sprays in fuel instead of water methanol. Now, it sprays it in far enough upstream to gain some cooling effect, ideally increasing the air density of the air intake charge, and it richens the mixture to allow for extra boost. Spraying aviation gasoline and trying to limit knock is nowhere near as effective as a water methanol mixture, but it's still something. My point is that C3 provides much less cooling, C3 injection that is, than MW50, which sort of leans into my theory that this was all about rapid cooling cracking the heads. I suppose the heads could have been cracking from the increased power with MW50 and not from cooling, but I don't think so. With C3 injection, power was up to about 1975. I don't think going from 1975 to 2100 is a big enough change to go from rarely cracking the heads to almost always cracking them. So I really do think it was due to the cooling of the water methanol system. Had MW50 worked out, the 190A4 with 2100 horsepower in its little airframe would have been a very good dogfighter. With full fuel and ammunition, it only weighed 38-34 kilograms, that's 8,453 pounds. An A5 was about 4,106 kilograms, so 272 kilograms, or about 600 pounds heavier than the A4. Now, the A4's wing loading is high. MW50 won't help with that. But with a power-to-weight ratio of about 0.248 horsepower per pound, the plane's acceleration, climb, and ability to maneuver in the vertical would have made it a very tough opponent. For example, the Spitfire Mark 9, probably the best dogfighter on the Western Front, was behind the A4 with 0.23 horsepower per pound. The Hawker Typhoon, a very capable airplane, was at 0.20 per pound, and the P-47, although not in theater at this point, would have been way behind here when they did show up. Of course, even if it did work, at this point in the war, it seems there was more focus on improving the 190's ground attack capability than in its use in air-to-air -air combat. Keep in mind, in mid-1942, the U.S. Army Air Force bombers had not yet become a major concern. The first B-17 raid in Europe wasn't until mid-August of that year, and that only involved 12 B-17s. The FW-190A4 could carry bombs, but they slowed it down. Adding the MW-50 got the speed back up. We absolutely know that the Germans were prioritizing speed for the ground attack version of the 190 because... We saw that with the U-17 strike package on the A-5s. In other words, the only A-5s that were officially equipped from the factory with C-3 injection were the ones set up specifically for ground attack. The reasons for this are beyond the scope of this video, but increased speed for a fighter bomber was useful for tactical reasons and, of course, for propaganda, because with the Allies bombing the Third Reich all the time, I think it was helpful for the Reich's leadership to be able to say that they bombed England, even if it was a pitiful bomb load striking a coastal town with minimal effect. Still, 
Had they got MW-50 to work on the Anton, and had they used it in all the versions of the plane, not just the ground attack variants, the Luftwaffe would have been much better equipped to handle the U.S. Army Air Force bombers and their escorts in 1943. It's hard to quantify the performance increase that could have come with the 190A5 using MW-50, but 2300 horsepower does not seem too far off had they been able to get this to work. Imagine a 1943 in which the 190A5 can not only attack the four-engine heavies, but can also tangle with any Allied escort fighter and even dominate them at low and medium altitudes. I don't think this would have changed the ultimate outcome of the war, but I do think it could have prevented the Allies from gaining air superiority over Western Europe, where the invasion was to take place, in early to mid-1944. Without air superiority over Normandy, the Allies would have had to push D-Day back, and pushing D-Day back even a few months could have had the effect of delaying the Allied invasion until June of 1945. That would have been a huge change to history. I appreciate you watching. Please like and subscribe. Also, consider joining my Patreon, where I have the pilot manuals for the 190A5, as well as many other World War II aircraft. This video isn't exactly my normal format. It's largely based on some what-ifs, um, which then lead to speculation upon speculation. But I think it's something interesting to think about. If you want to go one step further, ask yourself what was stopping the Germans from just shipping metals from Africa to Italy and then going over land into Germany. Ironically, it was another airplane, one that was pretty close to useless if enemy fighters were around, but was able to sink an awful lot of unarmed and lightly armed merchant ships. It's sort of ironic that when you zoom out and look at the big picture, the swordfish was actually making a dent in the air war over fortress Europe. That's all for now. Goodbye and have a great day.